purpose of the lab is to get you inspired for the whole course. So we're going to go over a multitude of topics, and we're going to talk a little bit about some math behind it, but mostly just qualitative flow visualization. So the pre-lab, you had to define the different flow visualization techniques. So why don't we go through those? There's the path line, timeline, speed line, and streamline. So Joel, I'll start off with the, let's say, uh, path line. Path line is the path traced by an individual particle. Control the die with these valves open and closed. You'll play with those. Okay, let's turn this thing on. So why don't we get some people over on this side? 
Oh, sorry, we have to fill it up first. I'm backwards here. I need two volunteers to pick up this plate. So we're going to fill up the tank with, just move it to the side. We're going to fill the tank up with this, with this brass. This brass pipe has brass brass water coming in from Cardinal Cogen. We're going to hook up this green hose to that pipe and then open up the valve. But so as someone goes in there and turns the uh, and connects the hose, I want you to think about what's the minimum pressure required in that pipe in order for this tank to be filled up to some high H. Okay, here. Someone can go in there. If there's a green hose and there's an attachment here, I want you to make that attachment happen. <laughs> So, what is the minimum pressure in the pipe such that the tank can be filled up to a high H? Okay, so we'll think about it still. And just so you guys all know, this valve here is now perpendicular to the direction of flow, which means that it's closed. So to open it, make sure that the valve is parallel to the direction of flow. So someone can go in there and yank it open. You might need two hands. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so now this is going to be open for a bit while we fill it up, so be careful and don't step in the hole. Um, any, anyone have an answer to the question? Something like that? Yeah, so there's another term in there which is important. The atmosphere. So if you take the water, when it reaches a certain height here, there's going to be some pressure that the atmosphere is pressing down on the free surface. And then there's also a hydrostatic component of pressure, which is present from that height H all the way down to the height of the hose. So that the pressure in the, in the fluid right down there has to be enough to overcome that hydrostatic component plus the atmospheric component. Okay, keep that in mind. So we're going to go with the board right now and let this fill up. I want you to pay close attention to the point where it gets about here. Because it gets, if it, if it goes too high, two things can happen. One, the airfoil can actually pop out, and then that's bad news. Or we can just be negligent, and the water can go over the top, and that's even worse than this. So pay attention while I talk. Let's go over to the board here. OK, so let's talk just briefly about um, equations of motion of fluid. So in week six or seven, I think you guys are 35, you go through you go through and you um, you'll see the generalized equations of motion of fluids in three dimensions and it's in time and space. Right now we're going to simplify all that down to one dimension and state. And the equation, let's say we have one dimension here, x pressure gradient, negative Row times the acceleration. So think about, you, you see this equation in class relating to hydrostatic pressure. I used it in Z, right? We had an E to Z equals negative row G, which you can integrate to get E naught plus row G H or E Z. So what does this tell us? Let's go back to our nozzle. What does this tell us as we go through the nozzle as pressure goes from high to low? What happens to acceleration? We find this equation. Right, so negative pressure gradient and negative row means it has to be a positive number, which means that our velocity increases as, as predicted. And let's look at what happens if we try to put an object in flow. So let's just say a flat plate in cross flow. We'll say there's some new infinity far upstream. We want to know like, the pressure around this plate so we can get the drag force on it. We want to know what happens to the flow around it. Let's take the, the streamline that's going to hit the plate right in the middle. Okay, the center streamline. What happens to this point here? What happens to the streamline at this point? It stops, it does, yeah. Some people say it splits, but you know, the, the streamline is infinitesimally small. So the middle streamline, if you ignore all real effects, will stop at the plate surface. We call this point here the stagnation point.
and if we're using this equation here, we just saw a positive u equal to zero, so the acceleration is now going to be this is negative. This negative sign here. It means the pressure is what is true on the pressure here and here. Acceleration is negative, this is negative. So the pressure goes up. The PDX is positive. So we have a high pressure here. And then our lower pressure up here. Probably going to go Okay, keep an eye on it. Another minute or so. And that's intuitive also. If you take your hand in front of the flow, you have you feel high pressure in front of your hand. Now, what happens to the streamlines that, that are above and below the center streamline? So something like this. It's going to come up and come around, right? And the same thing for the issue on the bottom. Now, think about what happens on the back edge of this plate. So, if you, you know, sailors or like kayakers or swimmers, just think, put your hand into a crossbow and visualize what's happening on the back edge. So, tell me. Create a wig, it splits out, one of the Yep, so like a, like a vortex sort of. Yeah, maybe like 30 seconds. So what happens is, it depends on the, on the size of your, of your plate, okay? If the plate is really big, you could be getting weights that are not interacting with each other, but if you have a plate that's of moderate size, where a vortex forms here, which actually affects the flow of the other side. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah, okay. So what this is called, is, uh, so the vortex forms on one side, okay? Inside the vortex there's a very low pressure with full flow into the other side toward it. So then just another one will, will form on it, right behind it. But the, once the uh, vortex forms, it has enough momentum that it will begin to break apart from the weight, the, from the behind of the plate. So what you have is this alternating vortex shedding pattern. Did you guys notice this in, in water or something? And uh, just a cool phenomenon that we're going to see a bunch today, so I'm introducing it. And as designers, we might be interested in what the frequency of these vortex, of this vortex shedding is, because you can imagine there's going to be some loading induced upon our plate every time one of these vortices form. There's a low pressure back here. So, we care about the frequency which these vortices form, and it turns out that there's, there's, there's a, a number, a non-dimensional number, which, is, which relates the frequency of vortex shedding to the velocity and the length of this plate. And it's called the Struhal number. And it's equal to the frequency f times the length l if we're using a plate like this. It would be a banner if it's a, if it's a silver sphere and divided by the free stream velocity. And this is sort of, you, doesn't mean anything right now because you don't know what it's equal to. But if you can find an expression for what the Struhal number is equal to, and you know the length and you know the velocity, you can actually calculate the frequency of these vortices. And that's, that's insightful. So it turns out that this number here is for most, for, for moderately turbulent regimes, for, for a large regime, because it depends on the, it's actually a function of another set of parameters here, which is called the Reynolds number, which we'll actually talk about in about 15 minutes. And for, t for today's, for all the flows we're going to be seeing today, it's about equal to 0 0.2. So long story short, you can get, you, you empirically find what this through number is, and then you can back out what the frequency is. Okay. Now, one more thing I have not mentioned is that there's going to be some drag force on this plate. Right? So that drag force is going to be due to the pressure difference between this side and this side. There's zero velocity at this edge of the plate, right? So the pressure goes up compared to the free stream pressure. On the back edge, you have these vortices forming. There will be velocity at that reach, at that edge of the plate. So there will be a higher V, so the pressure will be lower. So you'll have a net pressure drag force in this direction. FP. And we'll talk about that more at length too. Now, one more thing before we start the start the uh, experiment. Let's take this plate and let's rotate it 90 degrees. Okay? So now we're taking a bluff body, which is something that's not 
in the direction of streamlines and turning it into a streamlined body. And we'll subject it to the same flow. And again, our middle streamline is going to come right up to the leading edge. Will it be stagnated? Yes. Anything with finite distance here, there's going to be a point in which there's, there's a stagnation point. And then it'll come around. Now, the actual pattern of flow around here is problem specific. There's many different options. So we can see <coughs> for, for a laminar flow, we can come around and reattach at the back. And the same thing we have on the bottom. Or you can get these mini vortices on the back edge. That's what you would get in reality. And even if you make the this plate long enough, you can actually start you get turbulent flow a distance along the plate. So you could have flow like this that comes along the plate and then kicks into turbulence at some point along the plate. We're going to talk about this in like week eight or, or nine of the course. The, so let's look more in detail though at the surface of this object and think about the, the velocity profile between the surface and the free stream. So let's blow up the surface here. And we know there's some free stream velocity or some distance above the plate. Now, what's true at the plate surface? What's the velocity there? Zero. No slip. Zero. No slip condition. Exactly. And there is some velocity gradient between this zero and this new infinity. It's going to be continuous if we're talking about a continuum, continuous media, which we are. So we can draw some arbitrary velocity profile. And what has to be true in this region, we call this the boundary layer. What has to be true in this region for this velocity profile to exist, or for this velocity gradient to exist? There's a key like uh, um, mechanism for this to for this to exist. Viscosity, friction. Okay. So friction is the the viscosity is the relating the relation between the velocity gradient here and how much each fluid is being sheared by a certain amount. I'm just writing this there so you have it memorized. This is an important equation. Um, so even if we're dealing with an inviscid fluid or like a fluid water we have today, it has a pretty low viscosity. Um, in the middle of the Two, we could say there's a maybe it's inviscid, but if you re go towards the sides or the bottom, you can't neglect this boundary layer. You can't neglect the viscosity in the boundary layer. Okay, so let's turn this baby on. Um, first, we can close this thing so that we can stand next to the water tunnel without dying. Now let's get like as many people as possible over here, just so we can turn it on. I'm not going to do anything. I want you guys to do it. So there's a plug. Um, it's, I think it's 240 volts, 220, I don't know. Big fat plug, fancy connector. There's an outlet right there, so I'm going to plug that in. And then there's a, a big lever, a handle here, off on. So if you want to just yank it on, this way, on this way. the way it says on. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and then there's a little controller box which is currently warming up and it's going to say 0.0, .0 hertz. So can anyone tell me why this is, we want to control the speed of the flow. Okay, that's what this is doing. Why would it say hertz? Speed of the pump. Yep, exactly. The pump has blades. Those blades are moving at a certain frequency. So we're reading out the frequency of the blades, and indeed there's a calibration curve on the side over there also, which gives you the flow speed as a function of motor frequency, okay? So let's start by taking it up to 2.5 hertz. There's an up arrow, just click the up arrow, and then press run. Yeah. Enter, right? Either one. Alright, 
so you can hear it, and you probably see some bubbles flying. I don't see anything yet, but I think it's running. Yeah. Yeah, you see something? It just kind of looks oily, but... Uh, okay. There's something. Good. Let's do some really basic stuff first. Let's use the, the red dye. You guys can play around with this. Um, the lab is basically for you guys to explore. The red dye, let's turn that knob on just about halfway. And right now it's in the width of the, of the airfoil, so it's going to look sort of different. And why don't we move it up to before the airfoil? We move that whole thing. Just so we're clear, we're going to do visualization of the airfoil separately, so let's not focus on that yet. Let's just look at the, at the flow from the, in the center of the pipe. So what do we notice here? It's very much together. Yeah, it's very much together. Very laminar. It's pretty laminar in here. So we're very low velocities. Let's move even further up here. It's pretty. It's laminar. Um, there's some... Yeah, ignore the airfoil for now. There's some interesting stuff happening there, but we're going to talk about that in detail in a second. It's like... So yeah, you even see right now with this, with this very low speed laminar flow, you see these sort of... They're remnants of vortices formed by some object upstream, which is undoubtedly our, uh, our dye injector. So you see this, it's sort of oscillatory, it was a second ago. Why don't we test the no-slip condition? So someone can pick that thing out of the container, out of the holder, and then stick it on the bottom of the tank and then lift it up and see if the fluid is, stays where it is. Take it out. Oh, yeah. Okay, and then lift it up. Pretty cool, does everyone see? So the no-slip condition is holding, and eventually there's going to be enough shear that the dye, the density of the dye will get so slow that you won't be able to see it. So it looks like it's been gone, but the no-slip condition really is holding. You get a nice, pretty visualization of like the shear boundary layer right above the surface, I like that. Try it on the wall too if you want. Sure. Cool, very cool. Okay, um, you can put that back if you want or do whatever you want. Why don't we experiment a little bit with, with changing with, with pressure where we'll put in a nozzle into the flow and then we'll try to figure out or we'll visualize how the flow is being accelerated. So we have these nice little plates that fit nicely in, this, in the middle of the tunnel. So why doesn't someone go in there and make us a nozzle? We'll turn up the flow to, let's say, 5 instead of 2.5. Don't be afraid to get your hands wet. So who can explain in, in technical terms, as precisely as possible, what's happening to this fluid as it's being accelerated? Why is it accelerated? Give it your best shot. Pressure is Pressure is, well, I'll tell you that's true, but it's not the reason why. By putting that plate there, you didn't change the pressure at this point. The pressure there is lower, but not because of the, of the So think about uh, a control volume that consists of this edge here, so we'll, we'll cut the, the, the tube here, and then at the wall, and then we'll cut it right at this exit, and do the same thing on the other side. So you have this, this cube of water, okay? And is it accumulating mass? No, right? It's in steady state. 
So all the mass coming in has to be coming out. And what's the equation for mass flow rate? Oh, come on, V30. Yeah. <laughs> it's rho VA, OK? So rho is constant for water, incompressible substance. So V and A are inversely proportional. And you have a big A here and a small A here, means the V has to be bigger back here than this. So that's the rationale for that. So now, you said that it's, there's also a lower pressure back here. And that's true. The low pressure is, is a function, is, is there because there's a higher velocity. And that's a formulation. We can, we can talk about that later in the course is in terms of energy balance, where you have, at the expense of, of pressure, you're gaining velocity. Now, what, using this intuition that the pressure is lower, could you explain why the free surface is lower back here than it is up here? You see there's this drop right here across the nozzle. Well, at the free surface, the pressure is atmospheric, right? And if I take an, uh, a height, a height h below the free surface, right here, and I walk further upstream, we know the pressure has to be higher upstream at this height h than it is here. Which means that the hydrostatic pressure above me, when I'm over here, has to be higher than it is here. And hydrostatic pressure is rho g h, which means the h on this side has to be bigger than the h on this side. Okay, it's just a function of the pressure difference deeper than the floor. Okay, um, let's talk about. Let's go back to the board quickly, unless you guys want to play with the plate anymore. Yeah, why don't you play with the plate? There's some pretty fun things you can do. You can turn the speed up to whatever you want. Just be, be careful of uh, the, the splashing out of the tank. Get your hands wet. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Don't want to jump in at once. <laughs> So there's you're, you'd expect to be some some vortices happening here, right? Mm -hmm. So why don't we can test that? We can take the the die and move it in the back seat and see if it's it's spinning around. Whatever you want, but yeah, you can already kind of see it. We're getting pretty pink here. So there's reverse flow happening there, quite a bit. Did you guys see that? Really? It was like there were these vortices forming on the, on the edge of, of the tunnel. Yeah, see that? Look at that. Ooh. That is neat. That is... That is awesome. Why is that happening? So... Are you not even sure? No, I'm thinking. <laughs> So there has to be some, any sort of vertical patterns in the fluid above that, if they're, if they're, if they're large scale and slow, if they're brought close together, they could become more powerful and, and uh, existent, but I'm not sure why, they would, why that would happen.
Wow. Could it have been because this was, it was like tilted a little bit? Was it? Was it? Yeah, this definitely is a perpendicular to it. And yeah. It needs to be more, it needs to be more like. Let's see if I can go again. <laughs> Look at the water level. <laughs> Let's turn the die up so we don't. So we save some fresh water for our next experiments. <laughs> It's hard to get that angle that we want. Yeah. But it was definitely not. Just from a visual perspective, is it still considered a or is it more tricky? Well, we can figure it out by looking. It's definitely target angle. Yeah, you can't really tell without the tracer. Mm -hmm. All right. Everyone satisfied? Helen <laughs> unsatisfied? Okay, let's go to the board. <laughs> now we're going to talk about flow around this uh, cylinder or sphere. Let's think about a cylinder sort of. Free stream. Again, there'll be a streamline which comes toward it and it will be stagnant. And if you actually solve the equations for the streamlines around this object in math, you'll get there's going to be one streamline which comes in and gets to be zero velocity on the surface. And the same streamline will start at the rear end and then go accelerate from zero velocity to free stream velocity at the other end. This is sort of kind of hard to understand, hard to think about because it means there's a streamline which is just like creeping along the surface at zero velocity until the other end. So but at the stagnation point, is there like one particle that just is always there, or is there? I mean, it's it's a theoretically yes, theoretically yes. Any irregularities in the flow upstream will cause that particle to be shifted, but theoretically it will. Okay, well, let's not worry about that for right now. Let's see what 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 happens when the flow comes around the sphere. So. Tell me, or draw, actually, yeah, draw. Someone draw, tell me what happens. There's more than one right answer, so don't be afraid. You have a line of flow probably just around like this to meet up with that stream on right there. Okay, cool. Sweet. Let's do another option, so we'll draw another one here. So you're saying the flow never unattaches or stays attached to the surface of the sphere. Yeah, there's no separation point. There's a separation point, right. The other option might be something like this, right? Where we saw before, where there are these vortices form on the back end of the sphere. How pressing? Okay. <laughs> okay. So we want to be able to compare or be able to, to to find a metric which can specify what's, whether this is going to happen or this is going to happen. Okay? So the way we do that is think, first think intuitively what is going to be true about the flow if this happens. I think you said lambda, right? It turns out it's more than just lambda, it has to be extremely lambda. So <laughs> high viscosity, well, just see a second. <laughs> so you can think of maybe high viscosity, low velocity flow would make this happen. Whereas this would be more about low velocity, low viscosity, high velocity. Right, so the way we, this is called, by the way, creeping flow, or Stokes flow. And since it's so nice and laminar, you can get analytical equations for what happens around the sphere, and then you can actually use those analytical equations to calculate viscosity, to incorporate viscosity. And we're going to do that in lab, the last lab of the class. We're going to calculate viscosity by, by dealing with creeping flow around the sphere. Now, the metric that we're going to use to compare these two cases is called the Reynolds number, which I hinted at earlier. So Reynolds is the guy's name. It's not Reynolds. So it's Reynolds' number if you want to talk about plural or possessive. Reynolds number 
is a ratio of forces, of momentum forces on the top to viscous forces on the bottom. So rho and V is for like a mass and volume, that's going to be like momentum. And viscosity is obviously like visco viscosity. So a low Reynolds number would correspond to a fluid with a very high viscosity and very low velocity, which would be this case, right? And a high Reynolds number would be this case. So it turns out for this to occur, for creeping flow to occur, we need Reynolds number to be like much less than one, I believe. Now I'm batting myself. Well, that's without using numbers here, we'll just say very low Reynolds number. Okay? So that means we can talk about laminar versus turbulence, where we're using Reynolds number as our metric. So laminar is low Reynolds number, and turbulence Okay, now, big drag here for a second, okay? Pressure drag. There's going to be some pressure gradient between the front and the back edge of these spheres, but for this sphere at least. This sphere, there will be no pressure difference because the flow is symmetric across the, across the sphere, across the sphere. Over here though, the minute that you separate from the surface of the, of the sphere, you have a low pressure region and a wake. So we have a low pressure down here and a high pressure up here. So we have some net drag in that direction. We call this point the separation point. And the drag force is obviously a function of the separation point. It's very sensitive to the separation point because the area over which this low pressure acts is sensitive to the, 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 the displacement of the separation point. So it's an active area of research because for streamlined bodies, you really want to push that separation point as far back as possible and minimize that low pressure area. So for, uh, for the military guys work on like wings with, um, so imagine an airfoil, and you want the flow to be, to stick on the airfoil as long as possible. So what geometry of the airfoil will allow that to occur? You maybe you add some flaps before and after. Um, maybe you have some suction mechanism that pulls the air in close to the airfoil to cause it to stick on the wing a little further. Maybe you ionize the air and then apply an electric field to kick it further in that direction. Actually, Professor Capelli um, does research in this. Um, and one of Professor Tang's students does research on um, inducing turbulence at the leading edge of an object. Because if the, if the flow is turbulent coming into the air, into the object, the separation point will get pushed back. That's why golf balls have pimples. So they induce turbulence by some mechanism using some like, variable geometry object, which then causes the separation points to move back and forth and control the pressure there. So anyway, it's a research area of interest. So let's go look at the sphere now. Um, we'll turn on the, I think it's green. Yeah, it's green. Let's move it in front of the airfoil so we can get a fresh flow. And keep your eyes open for the separation point and look for the pressure, the, 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 the weight behind the sphere. So turn the die on, please. Turn the on? Yeah. Come in close and look. I've got a lot of it's going up down the bottom. That's just because the, the, it's, it's sort of tilted at an angle. And the same oscillating vortex shedding pattern happens here too, only we can't see it as easily because there's more degrees of freedom for where these vortices are formed. If this was our cylinder, it would be easier to see, and we will see that later on. So what should happen, what do you think intuitively will happen if we increase the velocity of the fluid to the separation point? Earlier? Earlier? Why? We're increasing the Reynolds number. True. Um, I think there's a lot. Yeah, you're you're right. And there's a, this is a complicated question, actually. Well, velocity is going to increase the Reynolds number. Exactly. Yeah, that won't actually. Uh, 
It will change the separation point. I don't have a good explanation for, for that. It turns out it actually pushes the separation point back a little bit because there's more momentum pushing that vertical region further down the sphere. So let's try it. Take a very close look right now of where the separation point is. And then increase the speed, let's say, to 8. I think ever so slightly it crept back just a little bit. Is everyone satisfied with the sphere? Alright, let's talk about the airfoil now. Go back to the board. Uh, that way. Oh. Yeah, turn that guy off. Here, okay, let's talk about the bone picture to begin with. So let's draw an airfoil. We call this the leading edge. We call this the trailing edge. The line that connects the leading and trailing edge is called the cord line, or the cord. And if we subject it to some uniform, some free stream velocity, the angle between the core and that free stream, is a different color here. That angle there is, is alpha, and the angle is hat. And so, airfoils are designed to generate lift at certain angles of attack. Anything could be considered an airfoil, like a flat plate could be considered an airfoil, but it would generate no lift at a zero angle of attack. It's looking like a symmetrical oval shape like that. So now, the lift force is going to be obviously in the vertical direction. And there's going to be some, perhaps some drag force as well. Now this drag force, I didn't mention it here, but I should have, is, it, is both the pressure drag, which is that difference in pressure between the wave region and then the front region, plus the viscous drag, which is like the, the drag induced by the shearing of the, of the fluid at the boundary layer. So keep in mind there's two drag, there's two types of drag, pressure and viscous drag. Okay, so let's talk about why airfoil works. So we'll draw some streamlines here. Again, we'll have a stagnation point for the leading edge. And we'll do streamlines that come around and plug it. We'll say there's some separation point back there. And then they get more and more gradually bent as we work our way further away from the airfoil. So eventually we reach, we reach free stream. Free stream velocity. Free. And the same is true on the bottom. We have these curved streamlines. So eventually we reach you with And at this at this distance from the from the airfoil, we also have a pressure P in front. Okay, could someone please explain how the airfoil generates the lift?
added to it. So we should see some oscillating vortices happening downstream. Is it not? We can open it all the way. This is our last one. So you can play with the angle of attack by pushing this in and then playing with it. And I recommend that you do that. Just don't pull it out. Comment on what you notice if you notice anything. What do you see? Where is? Can you see the separation point right now? Move the sphere from the front, perhaps. Oh uh, yeah. Thanks. Do you sort of see? Point sort of like midway along the airfoil where the vortices start to form, and if I change the angle of attack lower, it gets pushed further back. So it stays attached all the way along to about three quarters of the way down. You can see that blue recirculation region at the back edge. Now, if you increase the velocity, the same thing will happen to the separation point. It gets kicked back, it gets pushed further back. So why don't we increase the velocity? Hard to see, but I think it did move back a little bit. So it turns out that the separation point um, is, is, gets pushed back with higher turbulence, which is why the on the sphere when we, put, when we when we turned it up, you said the Reynolds number went up, 
it's becoming more and more turbulent. There's more sort of momentum to push that separation, push that vertical structure further back. The separation point gets pushed further back. Like the golf ball. Like the same reason why golf balls have to. Same reason why that swimsuit that they the speedo, speedo swimsuit worked because they induced turbulence on the leading uh, induced turbulence on the surface of the swimmer. Is that what they say? Shark skin does too. Exactly. Put, like, something in front of it. Why don't we put the red one in front of it so we get another one? What's it at right now? What's the number? Uh, Ten. Okay. Take it up to 15. And then you can turn the red on too. So notice what's happening with the level of the water above the airfoil. And so there's the, the pattern that the, this vein is introducing, which is interesting. But beyond that, there's also ripples due to the low pressure above the airfoil. And they're pretty persistent, so you can see this like ripple pattern, which persists all the way down to the back edge. Let's take this out. You guys see that? I think that's pretty cool. You can play with it, it changes the frequency of those waves. Take a look, guys. Get in there and play with it. This is meant for you guys to do. You can get in the way of the camera, don't worry. Try, try stalling. Okay, 
tell I've got for the water tunnel. If you guys want to do anything else, you can. We're going to go over the smoke tunnel in a minute here. Right here.
fuel, uh, fuel and air are mixed in this device. Anyone know what this is called? Carburetor, exactly. Fuel and air are mixed in this device, and then they go through the valves, which are timed by the camshaft. So these cans here open up the valves at the right times, and then they let the fuel mixture into the cylinder. The cylinder compresses, the spark ignites it, and then it gets pushed down and combusts. Then the cylinder comes back up and exhausts that stuff through the exhaust valve, which is the red, the red pipe here, so it's one of those two valves. Uh, and then the process happens again. This here is a, a fan for cooling the engine. It's not a propeller. Um, nowadays they use water coolant and there's enough incoming air, ambient air, to cool the engine as is. They don't usually have fans anymore. This is extremely inefficient because at low speeds... Yeah, anyway. It's not that used anymore. Um, if you look on the back end here, so you can think maybe that the exhaust coming out of the engine has it still has energy, it still has high entropy. You want to use that entropy for something. So what you do is you send it through a turbocharger. So some cars have turbochargers on them, this one has it. So you run exhaust through a turbine, which also drives a compressor. Go take a look at the back, I'm sorry. Exhaust drives a turbine, which drives a compressor, which compresses your inlet air. And that inlet air is just Packed into a smaller volume, so for a given stroke, you can actually get more fuel and more air, more bang for your buck. Now, turbos are pretty interesting because they're running at super high, high rotation, super high speeds. So the, the bearings in there are really important to design, and they're using fluidic bearings. So there's a layer of oil in that bearing. So your problem in homework one with the stomper is very applicable in that. It's basically the same problem. So that's an application for those right there. I see engines are awesome and there's so many parts that come together, there's fluids, there's heat transfer, there's mechanical design, there's power, power electronics. Um, it's just a pretty marvelous piece of engineering. By the way, this is where the transmission would be right here. Okay, the crank would come back this way. This here is a heat exchange, or uh, oh, sorry, a combustor. It's one of the combustors that we saw in the annular combustor of that jet engine. So the fuel and air coming this way, combusts, the combustion propagates down the length of the, of the combustor, and you'd, want, you'd like it to be completely combusted by the end, because otherwise it's going to, there's going to be unburned fuel, and unburned fuel is bad for, it's wasteful and it's just bad for emissions. Emissions are extremely, uh, it's like the, the driving, the limiting factor for efficiency is often emissions. It's what, the, it's what designers spend a lot of their time worrying about. So why do we have these, these holes here? Why do you think? Cooling. Yep, exactly. So the, the temperature of combustion is hotter than the temperature, the melting point of steel. So you need, you need to keep there a thermal boundary layer between that combustion and your material. So that's what this is doing. It's also, it's cooling, but it's also um, mixing fresh air with unburned fuel. So you have this mixing combustion happening all the way down the line through. Okay, cool. And this is a turbo, also a close-up of the turbo. You can see these bearings in there. They run at, this is at 150,000 RPM, so it's super high speeds. Okay. Now onto the smoke tunnel. Same deal with the smoke tunnel. Um, air Let's comes in the nozzle, and now we're expelling air through this vent down here. So there's a screen on this side of the, of the inlet that keeps the flow uniform and laminar of the, of the inlet here. To visualize the flow, we're going to use smoke. So we're using stuff called fog fluid, highly precise uh, engineering material. And we're going to vaporize the fog fluid with wire, and then a mini blower is going to blow that fluid into the rest of the stream, the rest of the airstream, and we'll get lines coming along the, the window that way. So, before we turn it on, how do you think, why do you think, so if you change the airspeed by changing the opening distance, this, this area of opening, can someone explain to me how that works to change the airspeed? The nozzle? The block that we put in. Yeah, yeah same, same principle. So I'll tell you that the blower supplies a constant mass flow rate, okay? And you're changing the area. 
What's the upgrade for the mask flow rate again? Yeah. So, water would row is constant, right? But air row can not row is compressible substance, right? Turns out for low velocities, anything less than Mach number of 0.3, the air can be considered incompressible. So we'll, we'll be doing that here. So air is incompressible, decrease A, decrease B. Alright, let's turn this guy on so someone can turn on all, of, all four of the switches. This thing was built in 1957. Um, what year? 57. And it's remarkable. It's so, it's so nice. I mean, you turn a dial on this side, and it goes all the way around, links back up to this thing in terms of that. So the airfoil, we've seen most of the effects of the airfoil, so I'm not going to go into too much depth with this. Um, I want you to look again at the periodic nature of the vortices on the back end. Also think about So these are streamlines that we're visualizing here, okay? Steady state flow. <laughs> the streamlines are getting closer together as you go over the surface of the airfoil. And no flow crosses the streamlines. It's like a wall. Okay? The definition of a streamline turns into the velocity flow. Which means that this can be considered sort of like a nozzle. You have some area here, some small area here. There's no accumulation of mass inside that control volume. Well, the Density is constant, so V goes up. So that's a quick trick you can play with streamline, streamline visualization. Um, go ahead and play with the, with the knobs if you get it to turn certain different angles. Yeah, it's probably installed. I mean, there's no, there's, everything is separated. Yeah. 
purpose, this is pretty interesting because this is a completely symmetric body subject to uniform flow, and we're seeing extremely non-uniform stuff happening in the back edge. So this is called Harman vortex shedding after the guy who discovered it, Theodore von Harman, in like the 19, like 1909 or something. He was interested in why wires strings sing in crossflow. You take a wire, you put it in a crossflow, and it has this resonance, it sings. So he's studying this and doing that with him. And he tried to make experiments with as uniform flow as possible and as symmetric a body as possible, and no matter what you can do, you couldn't get uniform flow on the other side. It always had this periodic nature. And that's just a function of the fact that there's always going to be instabilities in this flow and on the surface of this, of this material, which causes this to happen. Um, this is extremely important for building things. Imagine this is a strut um, for a bridge uh, or a, a cooling tower. And you, it's long and it's, very, it's not very stiff. It can fall over. So there's been stories of, of actually cooling towers and power plants, one downstream from the other one. The one downstream collapsed spontaneously in like 20 degree wind. And they did you know, analysis and realized that it was the resonance mode of the second one was the same as the frequency shedding mode of the first one. This actually comes into play with the, the World Trade Centers. Uh, I read a book on this, so I know about it. And that there's a, two World Trade Centers, okay, let's say here and here. It turns out when they were designing them, after they had already all, the plans were all set, they had the, the permits going, they couldn't change the designs. They made a wind tunnel test where they built up a model of New York and they subjected it to flow from certain directions. And they found that the frequency shedding, period of frequency shedding off the first tower was equal to like the fifth harmonic of the second tower, something like that, some, some non-primary resonance mode. But enough to be worried. And they couldn't change the model. So what they did was they had to stiffen the structure in that axis. Like, this is tower one, this is tower two. Wind's coming here. They had to stiffen the second tower in this axis without changing anything. So what they did is they took the core of the tower, which is the elevator and structural support, and they turned it 45 degrees so that the long axis is in the same axis as the, as the wind loading. So it increases the moment of inertia in that axis and make it stiffer. So the two towers were identical except for that one difference. Nothing was kind of um, Also, I'm sure you guys have seen the Tacoma Narrows uh, movie, which I like, so we're going to play it again. So this is the reason 
why aircraft take time between landing and taking off, and there's like, you know, 30 seconds to a minute between aircraft taking off and landing. And that's because these things form, a big airplane will, will, it will form, and then a small airplane comes in and it gets thrown by this little vortex. There have been accidents in which airplanes have crashed. So in New York in 2003, there was a, a small plane coming in behind a 747, and it hit some turbulence, which was because of the wind tip vortex from the 747. The pilot overcorrected and broke the rudder, and the plane crashed and killed like 50 people on the ground. It's a small plane, but um, and there, I'm sure there have been other examples too. <laughs> What's true inside that vortex? What's the pressure like? Super low, right? Air has water vapor inside of it, right? Well, if you take that pressure and you drop really, really fast, or just drop the pressure a lot on the PV diagram, you go inside the vapor dome, right? So some liquid air is going to exist. Some, some liquid uh, water vapor is going to exist inside the air. That liquid water vapor is visible. It's, there's a droplet. So you're looking, you see a pore of, of, of water, condensed water. So that's one of the types of contrails that we see in the sky. The primary contrail that you see is the combustion products coming out of the engine. But if you look at the tips of the wing, especially during takeoff and landing, when there's, there's high humidity near the uh, boundary layer of the earth, so near the, the ground, you'll see these wings of vortices in there. They're pretty cool. And they happen a lot. I've seen them like, I don't know, every, maybe every five flights I see them. So take a look. The video for this I have too. These are extremely persistent beasts. There's a lot of work that's being done with, with air, airfoil over this wing. We're going to look at it top down. I'm going to do this real quick just because it's hard to put in. Drop the pressure a lot 
on a PV diagram, you go inside the vapor dome, right? So some liquid air is going to exist. Some, some liquid uh, water vapor is going to exist inside the air. That liquid water vapor is visible. It's, there's a droplet. So you're looking, you see a pore of, of, of water, condensed water. So that's one of the types of contrails that we see in the sky. The primary contrail that you see is the combustion products coming out of the engine. But if you look at the tips of the wing, especially during takeoff and landing, when there's, there's high humidity near the uh, boundary layer of the earth, so near the, the ground, you'll see these wing tip vortices in there. They're pretty cool. And they happen a lot. I've seen them like, I don't know, every, maybe every five flights I see them. So take a look. The video for this I have too. These are extremely persistent beasts. There's a lot of work that's being done with airfoil 